hello and welcome back to the Prison Officer Podcast. Before I get to today's topic, I just want to take a minute to thank one of our sponsors. Innovation has always been a key to success of Pepperball. And the Pepperball Blast is just one more way to deliver a payload that's going to distract, disorient, or incapacitate an inmate. The advantages of this handheld, lightweight, refillable launcher make it perfect for every correctional officer's use of force toolbox. It's the ideal short-range solution for law enforcement and corrections. It's effective up to 10 feet, it's lightweight, and it's refillable. Perfect for carrying in a holster on your hip or a vest or in your hand as a member of a cell extraction or cert team. Each reloadable blast contains up to three projectiles worth of Pava powder. And when the quick flip safety is turned off and depressed, the Pava powder is pushed out from the tube by a 1.8 uh, gram nitrogen cartridge. This will quickly cover the inmate and saturate the cell. And since there's no actual projectiles deployed upon firing, this is truly a non-lethal product with no impact. To learn more about Pepperball and, and the Pepperball Blast, go to www.pepperball.com or click the link below in today's sh uh, show's information guide. Pepperball is the safer option first. And if you haven't done so, please take a moment to like my podcast, or better yet, hit the subscribe button so that you'll be notified when the next episode comes out. Okay, welcome back to the Prison Officer Podcast. My name is Mike Cantrell, and I'll be your host today. Uh, I've got a special guest today I've been waiting quite a while to talk to. His name is Dr. Mike Pitaro. He is an associate professor of criminal justice with the American Military University. He also serves as the Director of Corrections for Northampton County Department of Corrections in Pennsylvania. Dr. Pitaro has worked in uh, correction administration, served as the Executive Director of an outpatient drug and alcohol facility, and as, a direct, as the Executive Director of a crime prevention agency. He's got more than 35 years of experience in education and criminal justice and continues to serve internationally as an author, speaker, and subject matter expert. Uh, he's the author of more than 200 publications and recently published uh, his most recent book, which is Contemporary Corrections. We'll talk a little bit about that today. Uh, this introduces students to the challenges and realities uh, facing corrections, not only uh, regarding the types of facilities and populations that exist, but also regarding the issues experienced directly by those who work in corrections and probation and parole. Dr. Pitaro holds a Ph.D. in criminal justice, an MPA in public administration, and a, uh, a B.S. in criminal justice. His areas of expertise are corrections, namely correctional leadership, and in providing education and awareness of suicide, uh, awareness of suicide among criminal justice professionals. So welcome to the Prison Officer Podcast today, Mr. Pitar. How are you doing today? <laughs> Or I'm doing well. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, <laughs> opportunity to uh, join you. Absolutely. I've read several of your articles over the years, and um, the one I want to talk about today was the one you had in psychology uh, today about mental illness, but we'll get to that here in a little bit. I always like to start my interviews the same way, and that's to start back at the beginning because mm -hmm. nobody comes into corrections the same way. So tell me where you grew up and, and what that was like and uh, some of those first steps you took into corrections. Absolutely. Um, I actually was born and raised in New Jersey. Um, I went to college out at Kutztown University, which is in Pennsylvania. After college, I decided to stay out here in Pennsylvania. And um, the real reason for it was simply because New Jersey is so damn expensive to live in and Pennsylvania is not. And so I right. stayed here. So I've been in Pennsylvania more than I have in New Jersey as far as my lifespan. Um, getting into corrections is, you know, like you said, it, some people fall into it, and I literally fell into it. Um, <clears throat> I ended up get, uh, graduating from college, and I applied for a job, and I was told to come in for an interview. It was a panel interview, and I've never been on a panel interview prior to that. <laughs> Absolutely. So I wasn't prepared for that. You know, you're nervous as it is going into an interview one on one. But now I have eight people looking at me and firing different questions. And I remember specifically, you know, when you're in an interview, um, I thought I nailed the, the response. I was like, oh, yeah, thinking to myself, boy, I really nailed that. 
And then one of the other members goes, elaborate. And I was like, oh, shit. Right. <laughs> that was it, man. That's all I had. So I actually walked away from that interview thinking I bombed and I wasn't going to hear from them. And um, about three days later, I got the call that uh, they wanted to offer me a position. And initially, I looked at it as, well, it's a temporary gig. I'll get a year of experience under my belt and then try to apply and go elsewhere. Right. And then 13 years go by. <laughs> <laughs> so and, um, and, and I really started to enjoy it. I, it was really a good thing for me. And, you know, I've always been inquisitive and I enjoyed working with the inmates. I know that sounds kind of odd, but I really and to this day, I still enjoy that, you know, wonder, trying to understand, like, how did you get to this point in your life? Mm -hmm. So it fascinated me. Um, after serving 13 years, though, I realized I wasn't really going to move up any further at that time uh, due to the fact that the individuals ahead of me were around the same age. So I decided that um, I was going to look elsewhere and apply my leadership um, skills to some other position. And I entered into drug and alcohol okay. uh, outpatient facility. Ran that, then went back to New Jersey where I was raised and um, oversaw a crime prevention agency. And then um, a friend of mine, as I also fell into this, yeah. a friend of mine uh, called me on a Friday and said, hey, listen, we have an open class that we need to fill. It's intro to criminal justice. Would you be interested in teaching it? I'm like, I've never taught in my life. I have no <laughs> idea what to do, how to do it. Um, I went there the first night and, um, I was like, man, it, it was at that moment. I realized that, wow, I know a lot. And it was simply yeah. from being on the job for all those years that you really don't, um, realize how much you retained. Mm -hmm. And what made it different was, you know, working with drug offenders, working with, you know, prisoners, you don't have a lot of success stories, more failures than success stories. And when I right. started teaching, light bulbs were going off. They were asking great questions and I fell in love with teaching. So, you know, fast forward another 12 years and yeah. um, the latest um, position, which I'm in right now is director of corrections is actually a political appointment. Okay. Um, I was asked by the county executive of the county where I reside if I'd be interested in the position. I thought about it a mm -hmm. lot <laughs> and decided that, you know what, I think this is a good time in my life. I'm coming on the tail end of my career. I think I want to kind of give this a, a run and, and apply everything that I learned over the years. Right. So now I'm sitting in the exact same seat where I actually interviewed back in 1989. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of surreal at times when I'm sitting on the other side of that desk. Sure. So I still have one foot in the door as a professor. So I'm still teaching with American Military University and mm -hmm. then also running the uh, Department of Corrections. So that's kind of the fast forward of how this all came to be. I just I've been very, very fortunate. And I say that all the time, uh -huh. um, you know, with publications, if you don't mind, I could even go into publications because that's an even better story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go share it with us. When I was um, pursuing my doctorate degree, I took an addictions course. And at the time, I was the executive director of a drug and alcohol facility. So I tried to bargain with the university to get out of that class because I'm like, I actually oversee an agency in drug and alcohol. Mm -hmm. I know this stuff inside now. Like, this would be a wasted class. It would be boring. I lost the battle. <laughs> <laughs> with the university, I had to take the addictions course. And when it came time for the final project, I was looking for a good topic that no one really touched on. And I was so tired of drug and alcohol, things here and there. I found um, an interesting article on sexual addiction to pornography. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, OK, let me check that out. Um, I wrote the um, final project. My uh, professor at the time said, man, this is really good. You should try to get it published. And I'm like. How do I do that? <laughs> right, right. And he gave me some tips on how to do it. And about three weeks after the article published, uh, I got an email from Frank Schmoliger, who was one of the leading authors in criminal justice. Hmm. And he wrote to me and said, hey, listen, I read your article. I really liked it. I'm about to publish a book called Crimes of the Internet. And I was wondering if you would co-author. 
and I don't even think I thought about it. I think it was like three seconds later. I'm on the, I just typed, <laughs> yeah. And then afterwards yeah. I was like, oh my God, how do I write a book? <laughs> right. <laughs> so that's how it started. And it, after that, it just, it kind of like spiraled and, you know, I did well. So that first book and honestly, Dr. Schmoliger, um, yeah. his name recognition and everything kind of ignited my career, if you would. So yeah. that's how I got into the publishing as well. So it's funny, all these uh, successes that I've had, I never really pursued. I just kind of fell into them and then, uh, you know, loved them. Sure, sure. Well, I find it interesting, and, and I, I also kind of feel the same way. You said after 12 years, um, you didn't know, really, that you knew so much. Right. And I was kind of the same way. I was yeah. there. I was an officer. I was going to work every day, and they kept putting me in positions, you know, that were a little leadership here or a little leadership there, and they kept telling me, oh, you do a great job. And it was probably 12, 15 years in before I stopped and said, I guess I'm a good correctional officer. <laughs> I didn't think about it up till then. It was just, you know, m going through the motions, going through the day, everything was the same. And uh, so that was kind of what uh, happened to me too. Up until that point, that was just a job. And then when I realized that maybe I do know something here, and that's when mm -hmm. I got into, you know, local teaching at the institution level and then outside of the institution. So that's interesting. We kind of have that in common there that yeah. we didn't really realize what we knew, you know, and the experiences that you've had, and what they taught you uh, until a certain point in that career. That, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, you're talking about publishing. So let me, uh, let's talk about this to start with. Contemporary Corrections, which is a, uh, a new textbook. I got to take a look at it and, uh, it's, it's put together really well. And from a guy that's been in corrections more than 30 years, um, I was impressed by it more than I have been with other correctional textbooks. Uh, I think you really hit it on the head with a lot of the, the subjects and, and building up to where we're at today, kind of, but I like the title. So tell me, why did you pick contemporary corrections and kind of go into that? Because Corrections has changed over my 30 years. It's changed over yours. Uh, but why contemporary corrections? And that's exactly the reason why most of the corrections textbooks have like an intro or foundations of or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. And they rehash a lot of the same literature that I read when I was 19 in college, you know, and I'm like, some of this stuff is really and from teaching, I know what the students like and what they don't like. So sure. I wanted to make this book more practical. Like I, I was looking at it like I need a book that's going to be useful. OK, mm -hmm. so you're going to learn a lot about corrections as a criminal justice student or even as an elective. Sure. But but more importantly, if you are interested in this career, I'm going to prepare you for entry into this career. And I didn't want to sugarcoat. So I wanted a book that was going to show the pros and the cons, the strengths right. and weaknesses. And I covered that, you know, as you know, we have very high rates of depression, anxiety, cardiovascular disease, divorce, mm -hmm. alcoholism, yeah. and of course, suicide. Our suicide rates are incredibly high. Mm -hmm. And I want people to know that, but I just don't want to make it like a doom and gloom type of chapter. Right. Then I introduce solutions. These are how yeah. you can kind of keep those uh, symptoms at bay, you know, you can avoid burnout. Um, so it's based on science. It's based mm -hmm. on Mike Patero's experiences. So it's kind of a combination of the two to make it a very practical, useful book. It is right. definitely unique. I must have read 10 other books. I guess you could call them my competitors. Right. Um, and this covers more subject matter than all of them. Oh, um, and absolutely. that's what I'm particularly proud of because I venture into, for example, you mentioned earlier, female offenders, you mm -hmm. know, females make up seven, eight percent of the entire U.S. prison population. So most book chapters or most books focus only a couple pages on it. I dedicate mm -hmm. an entire chapter because yeah. even though they represent 7%, there's unique challenges that we face in corrections in dealing with female offenders. There's different pathways that they take to get into the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And there's different ways that they need to essentially survive during reintegration. Um, right. Focus heavily on mentally ill, as you know, 
Um, the number of mentally ill offenders has increased by like 500 percent over yeah. the last couple of decades. So we have more mentally ill individuals incarcerated than we do in psychiatric facilities. So and I, I really that... want to, to promote that to, so people know about this. I didn't want it to be all like so most of the books um, for university students, they, they're all positive. But I want like, OK, there, here's the negatives, though. Mm -hmm. So you're prepared. And this way, when you enter this profession, you're ready to go. You're ready to rock and roll. So right. I'm really happy with the book. I have to say, I mean, I think every author would say something like that, but right. I really am happy the way it turned out. And it's been getting great reviews and that makes me even happier. Yeah. You know, I, I've, I've read a lot. I've got a lot of the books. Um, and to me, you know, you go back and you take a look at uh, Sanford Bates, you know, Prisons and Beyond, 1930. And they're all written back then about yeah. prisons. And you not yeah. only, just like you mentioned, you talked about special populations, but you also go into jails. And mm -hmm. I don't, you go into most of the tech books that was textbooks that we see about corrections, and they're not talking about jails. They're not talking about probation and parole. They're not talking about, you know, you kind of, um, I found it interesting because your book covers not only from jail to sentencing to prison, special corrections population, probation and parole, and then recidivism. And corrections has expanded from the 1935 Sanford Bates peniology. Do we even have any peniologists anymore? Is no. that even a thing? Yeah, that's exactly. Thing. <laughs> yeah. So that's what corrections used to be. And, and you took it from sentencing or, you know, jail all the way to recidivism. And that is where corrections is at these days. We're touching all of that, including the special populations with the mental health. So that was one of the things I really liked about your book was bringing all that in there. And, and talk to me a little bit. Uh, you've been around for a while. Talk to me a little bit about the difference between what jails are facing these days and what prisons are facing. Similar, I mean, similar challenges, I guess you could say. One of the main reasons I wanted to include jails in there is because they're rarely included. Right. <laughs> and most of my students were starting out in positions at local county jails mm -hmm. um, rather than state penitentiaries. I also minimized the sections on the Federal Bureau of Prisons because in all my years of teaching, I've only had two that ended up in those positions there. So I was mm -hmm. trying to look at the bigger picture, like where are you going to be more employable at? Right. Um, but jails are important because we're facing a lot of the same challenges as your state prisons. Um, but jails, as you know, can be a little bit crazier at times because you have that high turnover. There, high turnover. There's very rarely any stability of any um, sort there. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I ventured into COVID and you know MRSA and talk about you know the things that kind of plague the jails um, are also found in our state prisons. Mm -hmm. But trying to, to kind of address both so that they both got their own fair share, I guess you could say, of information being out there. But I wanted yeah. to touch on that because, like you mentioned, there's very few courses that really delve into jails. Um, yeah. And the books talk about it briefly, but that's about it. And when they do talk about it, though, again, it's more from a historical perspective. And honestly, a lot of students don't care about that. Yeah. Of course, I'm going to go, you know, the Cook County Jail and, you know, Eastern State Penitentiary. I'll do the progression, but I like jump 100 years each time. So it's I yeah. don't drown them in history, but more in the practicality of it. I focus they need a lot on 1960s to present day because 1960s yeah. is where we saw a lot of the changes in the criminal justice system. Sure. Um, with the Supreme Court rulings in law enforcement, everything. So really, from a historical perspective, anything prior to 1960 was kind of minimized. Mm -hmm. And then I really focused on that because I think that's where the kind of the meat is at, is sure. uh, 1960s, the current day, to also see how we got here, you know, with the war on drugs and with mm -hmm. three strikes and everything. So I think it came together really well showing that. And I also want to emphasize that, you know, some individuals outside of criminal justice don't realize that jails can be just as dangerous. Um, or more so. friends who are shocked <laughs> when we find out that, you know, you commit a, you know, a quadruple murder, you got to go stay at the local jail until you're sentenced. And people are like, what? Yeah. <laughs> we thought we go right to the state penitentiary. I'm like, no, absolutely not. Not until you're convicted. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of educate 
my students, but also the public. And I'm very fortunate because uh, Walmart picked up the book oh. and um, as well as Target. So that's good because then it opens up to your just general readers who might be interested, which is really mm -hmm. unique for a university textbook to step outside of that college arena. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things, and it kind of goes into what we were talking about, that the difference between jails and prisons, you were talking about mental health. You go to a jail, the mental health they're dealing with are, are wholly untreated, right? They've yeah. either not been treated recently or, and they're completely off their meds or they're not probably not following it. And then once they get to the state or feds, which is where I've been uh, worked and specialized in, you know, we may have a mental health housing unit. We may yeah. have mental health all in one area, nurses assigned to them, checking their pills, doing this. That's really hard to do in a jail. So they're dealing with people with, when we talk about mental health, who are just off the hook. I mean, you know what I'm saying there? Absolutely. Yeah. It's a, it's a tough group to work for. And even though the training for officers and staff has improved, we're still not really fully trained into dealing with this population. And I'll admit that's, that's one of my weaknesses. It's a tough group to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the, the facility that I oversee, uh, we have an entire unit yeah, dedicated yeah. to those with um, some of very significant mental health problems. Sure. That do things that are just odd and quirky, and, you know, so it's very difficult to manage that particular population. So it, there's definitely a breakdown in the system there. Um, I'm an advocate for getting psychiatric hospitals back intact. Because mm -hmm. um, a lot of these individuals, they'll spend months upon months in jail waiting, then they go there and get time served. And the reason they waited so long is because they had to get stabilized by the medication to understand the proceedings. Sure. So there's a lot of uh, cracks in which these individuals can fall into, and it makes it really difficult. Then you got to find housing for them and where are they going to go? You right. know, some places won't take them. Some shelters won't take them based on past behavior. So it's more difficult yeah. than a lot of people imagine, but it's a very, very challenging type of criminal offender. In your article on Psychology Today, you said uh, today nearly half the people in the U.S. jails and more than a third of those in U.S. prisons have been diagnosed with a mental illness. That's huge. It's very huge. You know, yep. uh, every other person, every other, every third person you're dealing with. And I spent 14 years at the Federal Medical Center in Springfield, Missouri. Um, we have some of the worst federal inmates mental health wise. Mm -hmm. And Unfortunately, what I saw was us getting inmates, great doctors, great, great psychologists, and, uh, psychiatrists, get them medicated. You got nurses who make sure they take it three times a day like they're supposed to, and they almost live a normal life. And then they're eligible to go to the streets because they've done their time. We've, we've got them acting right. And as soon as they walk out in the streets, they have this, uh, you know, well, I don't need this. I didn't need right. those pills. They quit taking it, and then I'm getting calls from a local sheriff. Do you know this guy? He didn't have any identification on him except for an inmate ID. Yeah. What can we put in the middle there? You know, how do we how do we monitor? The, and you're right. We don't want them in the nursing home with our grandmothers. No. Gosh, so how no. do we have this in between? How do we what, – what can we put in place there? We need – I mean, I shouldn't say this, but I mean, most of it depends on the communities where they're going to. Mm -hmm. um, I live in an area that's dubbed uh, the Lehigh Valley. It's like um, multiple cities. And so there's a lot of resources and programs available for those being released, whether it's substance abuse, mental illness, so forth. But if you go 30 minutes north of where I live, now you're in the mountains and mm -hmm. there's no transportation, housing or those programs or resources. Yeah. So that's where there's a huge breakdown. I think where we are kind of rich and plentiful with resources and programs, we do a good job. And we've created that seamless continuum from prison to the community. We now partner mm -hmm. with community-based um, agencies, and that has improved and increased since the early 2000s. So I would mm -hmm. say it much depends on where. But That's true. for a good portion of them, you know, if you go 30 minutes one way or another, you're in a different time world, if you would, you know. Yeah. 
and they don't have the, the luxury of doing so. But like you mentioned, it's getting them to continue taking their medication and go into these appointments. And a good portion of them, and I don't know the exact numbers, but they just don't go, you know, right. or forget or sell their meds yeah. or lose them, whatever the case may be. And next thing you know, they're picked up by the police on something that's typically a nuisance type of crime. Right. And they end up, there we go, six months, nine months before we um, resolve that issue again. So sure. it's like a re recycle, um, what is it, revolving door. Yeah. And I think it's burning out the police just as much as the courts and corrections as well. Right, and the jails. Yeah, because mm -hmm. they're, they're dealing with that all the time. Yep. Um, another thing I saw were what I considered low level or... I don't want to say minor mental illness, but it wasn't at the level of, you know, a violent schizophrenic or whatever, but we'd get these guys in there with mental illness who were, you know, basically had the mentality of a child or something. Mm -hmm. Now you've put them in a violent prison, which prisons are, whether people like it or not, this is a place where a lot of inmates go to become criminally educated. Yep. They get better at being a criminal and same thing happens to our mental health. They're brought into that. You know, they're taught how to be more criminal. Um, I, I, I'm like you. I wish we could separate our mental health out of our prisons again uh, because I don't think it's healthy for them. I think we make criminals out of some people with mental health issues sometimes. Absolutely, and that's a good way of looking at it. Um, well, two things popped up when you were talking about that. Mm -hmm. um, the first being that mental health courts they work they're just like the drug courts um so it's getting all the other jurisdictions though throughout the u.s to jump on board so my county has a mental health um, court which addresses Inter those issues there so they can kind of supervise those individuals while they're in the community a little bit better um, than other counties that don't have that particular resource hmm. available to them okay so that's a really good thing um, but it is definitely a broken system and it's, it's a really challenging group overall and all the research, all the research right. suggests that, um, it worsens their conditions. So it doesn't sure. make things better. It doesn't make them the same. It will worsen things mm -hmm. because now you don't like to be around people. You know, you, you kind of got that edge where you just don't like to be in closed quarters with the people. Next mm -hmm. thing you know, we got you in with three other guys. You know, yeah. so it really is tough because it really makes things worse for them. So yeah. we don't see a lot of progression, uh, I would say, as far as them behaving better. Maybe the meds will stabilize them, be mm -hmm. a little bit more coherent. But for the most part, it's it's a challenging group, particularly like you mentioned, if there's some type of a significant mental illness. Right. Then it's a little bit more difficult to treat that person because, you know, they're typically resistant. They don't want to take it. They think we're poisoning them. You know, there's yeah. all variations to it. But, yeah, it's it's a tough group. Yeah. I don't think the general public knows um, what happens to mental health inside prisons. You know, not only are they criminalized, but they're also victimized. You mm -hmm. know, some of the stuff that happens to that population if inmates were allowed to do that to each other and the, the inmates that could be vocal about it, or if staff did that to an inmate, the the public would just go nuts. But because they're mental health and they don't really have that much of a voice, and when they do speak up, people may not believe them because they're talking about balloons as well as, you know, something else. So right. you, you don't believe them as much. Uh, so I don't think the public understands what happens when we throw those mental health people in our prison system. It's just sad. Here's a perfect example. You have an individual who is cutting himself, anything he could get his hands on, he's cutting himself, any type of self-harm that he can do with whatever he has access to, which mm -hmm. is limited, but still. Sure. Um, so then, you know, we try to bandage up the wounds, you know, we try to, you know, address those concerns. And then the person tears apart the bandages and starts ripping at the wounds and Yep. You know, next thing you know, you got to put this individual in some type of re restraint chair or some type of passive restraint system. Well, if you're an outsider looking in, you're like, oh, my God, that's cruel and unusual punishment. Sure. But then it, my response is always, well, what's the answer? Then? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I'm trying to keep this guy from harming himself, you know, and yeah. I don't 
there's limited options available. I would what love to invite do? them in. I'd yeah, love to we, invite them in. Yeah. We, we, we had an inmate that we built a stainless steel cell for. It's stainless steel. It's welded in the corners because he could take paint chips. Yeah. He could rip off paint chips mm -hmm. and cut himself. Yeah. He was taken to the hospital, I don't even know, 50, 60 times. So much that the hospital finally said, I'm not cutting through the scars anymore. Yeah. Because he had cut the same area so much. And you're right. We end up putting them in four points, which is, we don't do that in a bad way. It's done very, very controlled, you know, with a team that knows what they're doing. Uh, right. We put them in restraint chairs. And the public thinks we're being mean, but we're keeping these people from, from injuring themselves any farther. Exactly. And I'd love to bring them in and just say, okay, now what? What right. would you do? <laughs> right. I know. That's what I mean. You know, we're limited there. I mean, you're dealing with somebody who is just determined to harm themselves. Yeah. Um, you know, and they got 24 seven to think of different ways of doing so, you know, and then we end up, you could, uh, assign an officer one-on-one, -on -one, but you know, We've done it. with, with officer shortages across the nation, that's not really feasible at times. I mean, it has sure. to be done, yeah. but it really hurts you as an organization doing so. So yeah, there's a lot of areas that need to be controlled. Then also there's, you got to watch as an officer, there's harm for uh, being assaulted. Oh, um, yeah. having some type of liquid thrown on you, whether it's urine, semen, feces, whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. you know, so it, it's, it presents itself as really challenging group to deal with. You know, yeah. a lot of officers, um, may not have the patience to do so. It, it does. It takes a special officer mm -hmm. to work Absolutely. in there because it's like working with uh, two year olds, you know, not everybody can work in a child care center because you'll go crazy, you know, <laughs> yep. and, and mental mm -hmm. health because it's, you know, four or five, six use of forces a day sometimes. It, it was, uh, yeah, certainly certain people. Yep. So I, I think you and I talking, and hopefully this will bring an awareness to it. Let me uh, pick your brain also. So you're teaching um, students who are looking at going in corrections, and I'm always fascinated by this. Uh, I love the fact that. When I was young, I don't know that there was a place that you could go to get a degree, you mm -hmm. know, in law enforcement, criminal justice slash corrections. You could go law enforcement, but they didn't they didn't cover corrections. So tell me what kind of students you're getting in there. What is it that they're looking for? Um, you know, the, the sky's open to possibilities for people that want to go in corrections these days, you know. So what are they in there looking for? I think there's just a general wanting to help others, you know, mm -hmm. to, to try to make a difference in someone's life. And I, I want the same thing, you know, and I commend people with that mindset. But, you know, I just when I teach, I want to make sure that you can't take it personally when people fail. You know, you do the best damn job that you can do every day and you go mm -hmm. home knowing that you did the best damn job. But at the end of the day, it's up to them to choose whether they apply what they have learned and the resources that are available to them. Sure. So, you know, I, I always tell people set realistic expectations. You know, you're going to have, unfortunately, more people that fall off the wagon and stay on the wagon. So it's, it's a different type of demographic to work with. And burnout is heavy. But, yeah. you know, I say focus on those ones where you are making a difference. People are listening to you. People respect you. So it doesn't come that often, but someone's going to thank you. And, you know, you you change the trajectory of their life you know, from that point forward, it's a good feeling. Mm -hmm. So we are making a difference and we are changing people, but it comes down to them. I always say change comes from within each of us, you know, mm -hmm. everyone knows the dangers of smoking and, you know, everything that is associated with it, but people will still smoke. They will quit when they are ready to quit and make yeah. that change, you know? So we can provide them with everything they need to change and to be a better person. But then again, it's also out of their comfort zone as well. So, right. you know, I want my students to also understand. And that's why I always say, like, when I was an undergraduate student, I'd taken psychology and sociology. I kind of looked at it like, wow, this, why do I have to take this stuff? I just want the good stuff. You know, I want all right. the courses on violence and stuff like that. <laughs> But all those courses come to play because if you understand how someone ended up in front of you, okay, behind those bars, you can understand how that happened. Granted, there are 
bad people in prison and jail, but there are also a lot of people that simply made bad decisions, bad choices. Sure. sure. Um, I'll we, give you an we, example. I, I, there's one, I used to say this at conferences too, because it's stuck in my head, but it was a local woman. She was incarcerated for drug related offenses, thefts, you know, nothing serious, anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, but as I, uh, started talking to her. She was very articulate. She's well spoken. She wrote well. And I finally had to ask her, "How are you here? <laughs> you sure. know, you this you just don't fit that stereotype, that image that we have." And turns out that when she was 11 years old, her stepfather started molesting her. Mm. Now that's not the worst part. The mother knew about it, but didn't do anything. She turned a blind eye. Yeah. So what does she do to repress these feelings? Alcohol. Drugs. The drugs progress to heroin. Next thing you know, you need more heroin, but you have no money. Well, now I got a prostitute. I got a barter. I got to steal to get that fix. Next sure. thing you know, she's in the criminal justice system. And the criminal justice system, I always describe it as a giant spider web. It's easy to get in, but hard as hell to get out of it. Yep. And so that is that's always stuck by me because I always tell my students, what if the stepfather was never in the picture and she had a good stepfather? It would have yeah. completely changed her life. Yeah. You know, and so it, some people are pushed into it. Some people are pulled into it that not everyone, everyone has the ability to make a decision. But yeah. sometimes those decisions, there's other variables at play there with it. So I, I'd like to present to my students the human side of it, you know, to understand a lot of these individuals, their upbringing. You can see how they kind of fell into a life of crime, I guess you could say, statistically, you know, poverty, yeah. quit school, dad's incarcerated, mom's a prostitute. You know, you could kind of see how that works. So they have a better understanding of dealing with people. And then also culturally, you know, mm -hmm. if you're raised, most of us that end up in college, you're raised in a middle class upbringing, but you're dealing with individuals that are in the low income brackets, you know, so you have to right. be able to kind of identify what their lifestyle is and not project your own onto them. Yeah. Yeah. I did an interview. They had me and an inmate on an interview, uh, last year. And, um, they said, well, you know, we talked for a little bit and they said, well, we're going to tell you what the inmate did, you know? And so they had the inmate tell me that he was in there for murder. And I was like, okay. And she said, you know, that, that doesn't seem like it surprises you. And I said, I didn't grow up where he did. You know, he grew mm -hmm. up in downtown, you know, this huge city. He was a gang member since he was nine. I may have done the same thing in that situation, right? never knowing any better, you know, uh, luckily I, I didn't. And I, you know, I, I probably had the opportunity to do bad stuff over the years, but, sure. uh, some people it's a lot harder to crawl out of that than it is others. If that's all you've ever seen, if that's all you've ever known. Yeah. Sure. Abnormal becomes normal, you know, sure. like, you know, things that we think, you know, like, um, smacking your girlfriend around well you think that's normal because your dad did that to your mom you know right. and you've seen it done before so you you that's the means to an end that's what you've learned yeah so yeah a lot of it is really learning social learning it, it's really powerful that you know especially when we're kids and, and young kind of tweens you, you know you're like a sponge you absorb everything around you everything that's said everything that you observe and so a lot of people become molded that way and that's the the mindset that they get. Yeah, absolutely. So being the, um, is it commissioner or director? You're the director. 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 So being the director, what, and I know that one of them is going to be retention and recruitment, uh, <laughs> but what are some of the big things you're facing right now? And, and how are you guys handling that? What are you doing to, you know, retain and recruit some of the best? It is. A, it's a challenge um, across the, um, the U.S., you know, trying to recruit and retain. Um, corrections has typically been thought of as a stepping stone to other positions, particularly in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to change that, that, yep. you know, make this your chosen profession. So it's not a stepping stone to do so. Um, but retention is hard because, you know, it's, it's a tough environment. And I'll tell you what's happening locally. Here's my theory on it is that the corrections salaries haven't gone up significantly with inflation yeah. and everything else going on. Yet warehouse jobs and a lot of those other jobs have increased significantly. 
Nope. So you can start at a county prison at say 40, 45,000, but you could also do the same thing at the Amazon warehouse. Right. So where you're not manda mandated for overtime, where you're not assaulted, where you're not like, you know, verbally abused and all those things. And I think it's hard because um, you have to realize what you're getting into and it, there has to be something deep inside your belly that drives you. So, yeah. you know, do well in this profession because you are dealing with a very tough crowd in a tough environment. And so a, a lot of people, I guess, um, as my young kids would say, they're not built for it. Yeah. So, you know, I think people like you and I, we were built for it. You know, we just have a different mindset and how we do so. So, but I'm also stressing, and if you've read like a lot of the publications, I focus a lot on leadership is that. Um, a lot of the old authoritative, punitive, disciplinarian type of leadership <laughs> doesn't motivate people at all. Um, uh -huh. And so I'm trying to change that. You know, I'm trying to look at it from a transformational leadership approach, you know, as a coach and a mentor. I try to look at everything as lessons learned rather than writing up the officer for something he or she did. What could you have done better? How could you have handled this? Obviously, right. depending on what happened. But trying to get out of that mindset, and, you know, because most people, the research shows that the individuals leaving corrections are not leaving because of the dangerousness of the profession. That what right. most people think, it's not that. You know what no. it is? Leadership. Yeah. Comes up on every single survey. Leadership, they don't feel like their leadership supports them, values them, um, will back them. And People leave because they just don't want that. They don't feel valued. And so I'm trying to change that entire culture by yeah. showing them that, yeah, I am interested in you as a professional, but also as a person, you know. So if you're having something going on in your life, I want to hear about it. Let's talk about it. You know, sure. now I can understand. I can try to work with you. So I think it's it's trying to build that trust that was never there for most of, um, you know, between the you lying officers and the you know, administration, there's always been that tension between the two. And I'm trying to find a happy medium there where we all kind of get along. Yeah. I, I do think the administration was more distant when I was there, mm -hmm. but then when you come down, we had, and this is my opinion, some people are going to balk at it, but we used to have sergeants and lieutenants and captains that had leadership that I don't see anymore. Um, they did come through, they did know who I was and why I was there. And, and, and they were tough on you. Absolutely. I don't have a problem with that, but I knew that if something happened, that captain was going to give everything he had to get me out of there. And I don't think that comes across anymore. I think we've, I think we've replaced true caring for your staff with pizza parties and it, it, it doesn't work. Right. Stop by, say, how are you doing? And then stop long enough to listen to what they tell you. And, you know, when I did rounds as a lieutenant, we were required to go to each post in the evening and it was tough. And sometimes I had 14 things going and I just didn't feel like I could get to all those posts. But when you're working a housing unit with just one or two of you and you don't see anybody else on an evening or a midnight post, when that lieutenant comes through and gives you two minutes that says, how you doing? And means it. It yeah. changes everything about how you work. Yep. And and once you change, and I just had this conversation, I'll, I'll quit rambling here in a minute. I just had this conversation with another guy and we were talking about leadership and he was talking about the leadership, the way it works. You know, we lead up, we lead down and people don't realize in corrections, we lead inmates. Mm -hmm. We set the culture for inmates. And like you talked, not all those inmates are, are violent, crazy people. Right. Some of them are just people trying to do their time. And they want an institution that has good leadership from top to bottom. Right. Because if it's safer for them, they're going to do more of the programming. They're going to do more of that stuff. There's going to be less shanks. I've seen that over my career, depending who was in charge as to the, what the inmates felt and whether or not all of them were making shanks because they knew, mm -hmm. didn't know what was going to happen tomorrow. Or if just the violent ones that were the problems, you know, were out there making weapons. So. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. It is. It's leadership. It's culture. But we've got to change the. We've got to change the narrative about how we see our staff, and I, I think you're spot on with that. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a tough one. I mean, 
you know, money wise, you could go elsewhere and make more money. There's no doubt, you know, it'd be sugarcoating it and lying to you. And if I said that, that's true, but yeah. So you got to find, you know, some intangible reason why you're there, you know, what, what's driving you to be there, you know? And so I have my own self internal motivation, my reasonings mm -hmm. behind it. And, you know, I hope people tap into theirs to find that so that they stay in the profession because it can be an awesome profession. Um, so working on trying to change all that. And I really feel confident in time. I'll be able to make those changes. But it's also, you know, it's a tough culture to penetrate. So it's going to take a little bit more time than, sure. you know, your usual employment opportunity there. So I'm, but I think that we can definitely make headway. And, and I wanted, I want people to see corrections as part of that profession in criminal justice. You know, it's not mm -hmm. the, you know, the ugly stepchild. This is, this is part of law enforcement in the courts. You know, it's a yeah. respected uh, position. I will be the first one when someone says guard i'll be like they're not guards they're officers you know and can try to like correct those you know those stereotypes of what they think we do each day and like i'm like wow you're way off <laughs> this is what we actually do in a day you know so yeah. to enlighten people you know as to what goes on you know we are counselors we're teachers we're enforcers all wrapped up into one shift Sure. And a lot of people don't realize that, that, you know, this gives you a great amount of experience in dealing with people. You, you learn mm -hmm. conflict resolution without ever taking a course on conflict resolution. Absolutely. So it, it's a really good working environment and it can work to your advantage. And for me, it's paid off and I want other people to feel the same way like this. This can benefit you and you can make a career out of it, not just a, a temporary job until you get to something else. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, so what do you have coming up next? Anything in the pipeline? Yeah, um, my next book uh, will be out next year, and it's focusing more on special uh, prisoner populations. Oh, okay. So essentially I'm dedicating each chapter to a particular demographic. So sex offenders, they have a chapter. Elderly offenders have a chapter. So all those uh, special needs, special populations, whatever term you want to use, because, um, again, there's really no books that delve deep into what's it like dealing with elderly offenders. You know, Pennsylvania mm -hmm. has one of the uh, I think we're the second highest elderly prisoner population in the United States. Yeah. So, you know, it's unique. You know, they're they're subject to victimization, exploitation, assaults, you know, so trying to understand them. They also have, um, you know, I'm 57, but the research shows that when you're incarcerated, you have the health problems of someone 10 years older than you. I'm sure. So I'm 57, I would have health issues of someone 67. So a lot of individuals don't realize that. So I, I go into describing what elderly offenders are and, you know, the things that are there about them, the challenges, but also then solutions, you know, um, for example, uh, I did an article on compassionate release, which I know yep. a lot in our profession go, oh, my God, that's soft. And I'm like, no, it isn't. It's actually smart when you think about it, because if a guy is bedridden <laughs> and he's been <laughs> incarcerated for 35 years and yep. he can't get out of the bed, he's got so many health conditions, he can't even walk to the bathroom. No. Yep. What threat is he to the public? And mm -hmm. all the research shows that after age 65, it's less than one percent recidivism rate. Less than one percent. Sure, it's a no-brainer. And, and look at the electronic technology that we have yeah. these days. If you're yeah. a little, put an ankle bracelet on them. If you exactly. want to make sure they're where they say they're supposed to be and stuff. There's a lot of stuff. Have them check in with a Zoom meeting once a day. I mean, there's things that we could do technology-wise to to make sure that they're not causing problems. But I've read the same stuff you have. Once they get past a certain age, you know, uh, you just don't have the problems with them. No, absolutely. So, and you look at New Jersey, for example, you're talking $75,000 for one elderly prisoner per year. That's yeah. insane. Yep. So, I mean, that has to be addressed. I'm not saying if you're like a convicted pedophile and you still have that kind of potential to do so. Sure. You know, and you are a threat to the public. But I, if we put things in place like a psychological background investigation, we look at everything before we decide. Yeah. But 
I think that some of these individuals need to be released. Um, I address females. I address substance abuse, obviously. Um, another one, the LGBTQ community. There's hardly anything written on that, but yet we're yep. seeing a, a spike in prisons with, um, you know, the members of this particular group. How do we deal with these individuals, you know, from a administrative position, from a correctional officer position? Mm -hmm. So I, I try to touch on things that no one is really touching on. That's one of the things I've been really good at with my career is I always look for the gaps, right. you know, I don't want to like repeat something that somebody else repeated. That's, you know, I could go find that in 50 different spots. Sure. What are they missing? So I try to look for the missing parts and that's, I think that's really my niche. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the things I've seen that you've published, I would absolutely agree with that. That's why I keep, noticing your name. I was like, there's an article. People need to talk about that more. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're doing a great job at that. I look forward to seeing uh, uh, that next book. Uh, I think it's an important book. It's, and I, I'm, I never chased it, but in the penitentiaries and places that I worked, it seemed like I was always dealing with one of those special populations. And I think there's probably a lot of other people that have to go through that too. And they're a challenge. Sometimes they take up your whole day. You can't oh, get yeah. normal stuff done because you're dealing with one or two people. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like you mentioned, you know, mental illness, but like say someone who has a really low IQ, you mm -hmm. know, and they, they, they think like a child. Well, my God, that person's going to get eaten alive. So, you know, I don't think people realize what we have to do to house that individual and to protect that individual, you know, so. I've tried to touch on, I tried to think of everything, physically handicapped individuals, you know, so I'm trying yep. to like look at the whole big spectrum of kind of those individuals that don't take up much of our prisons and jails, but yet their, their numbers are rising and we still mm -hmm. have to deal with them, you know. Yep. Um, another one is a juvenile who's 15, committed a murder, but now they're waved up as an adult. Great. Punish them but they're still chronologically 15 years old. And now you're putting them in my facility and I'm like, I got to figure out what am I going to do to protect yeah. this kid? Cause he still is a kid, Absolutely. you know? So, you know, a lot of people don't understand like all the things that go into trying to keep a prison or, and or a jail safe and secure, um, not just for your officers and so forth, but between them themselves to keep them mm -hmm. safe. So, yeah. You know, a lot on sex offenders, a lot on child sex offenders. So I really tried to, to hit the entire group of, I guess you could say those outliers, you know, right. the ones that only come in infrequently, but yeah, when they do come in, it's a challenge. Sure, sure. Well, I thank you for all the stuff that you do put out there the, the for the public, for the correctional officers. Uh, maybe next year I can get you back on here when you, mm -hmm. the other book comes out. Sure. Uh, and we'll get together and, and talk some more about that. Uh, if somebody wants to reach out to you or get a hold of you, where can they do that at? I'd probably say my personal email. It's really easy. It's um, crime. Okay. So the word crime, okay. the letter N as in Nancy, justice at P as in Paul, T as in Tom, D as in David dot net. So crime N justice at PTD dot net. I'm all over social media too, so it's easy to track me down. You could look me up on LinkedIn and my email's there and everything. So sure. but that's the and best way. I'm on email almost 18 hours a day, so I can easily respond back and be the best way to reach me. Phone calls, unfortunately, my, my schedule's hectic. Right, right. Well, I'll put, uh, I'll put your email and uh, your LinkedIn and a couple of other uh, places that uh, I see you on the internet. I'll put those in the show notes. So if anybody wants those, they can look down there. Thank you so much for coming in and, and doing this interview. It's been fascinating and uh, I look forward to talking to you next time. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate this opportunity. This was a good time. Excellent. Have a great day. You too. Hey guys, before we go, I'd like to take just a minute to thank one of our sponsors. Uh, Omni Real-Time Locating System is a company that I've been working closely with for a couple of years, and I'm super proud to be part of this innovative team that has developed the best real-time locating system on the market for your jail or prison. Omni's PREA-compliant real-time monitoring technology is the very best way to track and record the locations and interactions of all inmates and assets through every square inch of your correctional facility. 
imagine getting an alarm the second an, in, an escape happens or being able to send a medical response the second an inmate's heart rate drops below a defined level. To learn more about Omni, go to www.ominirtls.com or click the link below in today's show's information guide. Omni's real-time locating system is a powerful tool designed specifically for the modern correctional professional. If you haven't done so yet, please take a moment to like my podcast, or better yet, hit that subscribe button so that you'll be notified when the next podcast is uploaded. Have a great day.